Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast, show number 53. Welcome to a real world MBA from the School of Hard Knocks, where entrepreneurs reveal what it really takes to make it. Whether you're already in business or you're on your way there, this show is for you. This is Bigger Pockets Business. How's it going, everybody? I am Jay Scott. I'm your co-host for the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast here again this week with my amazing and lovely wife and co-host, Carol Scott. How's it going today, Carol? Doing well. Happy anniversary, Jay. Oh, happy anniversary. podcast anniversary. That's right. Happy one year podcast anniversary, Listeners, oh my goodness, thank you so much for all your overwhelming support, for your feedback, for your reviews, for sharing. We have reached our one year anniversary of the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast, and we certainly could not have done it without all of you, without all of our amazing guests who have shared so much knowledge, so much expertise. It's become such a great community together, and we could not be more thrilled. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Also, during this crazy time, of course, we are all just working together to try, working through this together to try and stay positive and stay strong. And everybody just know that we will come out of the other end of this one way or another. So we hope you're all hanging in there. In the meantime, we have somebody really awesome for you to listen to today. Yeah, we have a, a great episode today. First, let me point out that this episode was recorded about six weeks ago, uh, pre pandemic pandemic. Um, that said, we're playing it today because it is probably more relevant now than it was at the time we recorded it. But I do want to point out if there's anything discussed in this episode that sounds like it's pre-pandemic, or if you're watching this on video and you notice that my hair has gotten a good bit longer since uh, since the episode was recorded or I put on a few pounds, yeah, that's because this was recorded a few weeks ago. But we have an amazing guest. Actually, on our podcast anniversary, we have our first repeat guest. So we're bringing back our guest from episode 30. Uh, his name is Mike McCallowitz. He's one of my favorite business authors. Uh, on episode 30, we talked about his book, Profit First, which was all about how to ensure that your business is making a profit from day one. Uh, if you haven't listened to that episode, by the way, episode 30 is absolutely fantastic. So Mike is the, he's the author of Profit First. He's also the author of four other books, Clockwork, uh, The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, The Pumpkin Plan, and Surge. And today we're going to be talking about his sixth book, which literally just got released this morning. So I hope you'll check it out. But his sixth book is a book called Fix This Now. And in this book, this is basically uh, the culmination of everything Mike has written. Basically, if you've, if you've read any of his books, this is probably the first one. If you haven't read any of his books, this is the first one you should read. It kind of encapsulates everything in all the other books. But it's all about figuring out what that biggest roadblock or that biggest constraint in your business is right now and fixing that issue and then moving on to the second biggest constraint in your business and fixing that issue and basically step by step fixing every issue in your business and Mike lays out an amazing methodology for both figuring out what the issues in your business are, solving those issues, and really putting your business on track to being hugely successful. So again, an amazing episode. It was recorded a few weeks ago, but probably more relevant now because a lot of us are facing new issues in our business, more relevant now than it was when we recorded it. So please listen to it, enjoy it, and hopefully it will help you with your business. If you'd like to learn more about Mike, more about the new book, more about his other books or anything that we talk about in this episode, please check out our show notes at biggerpockets.com slash biz show 53. Again, that's biggerpockets.com slash biz show 53. Now, without any further ado, let's jump into our discussion with Mike McCallowitz. Mike, welcome back to the show. Jay, I'm a, I'm a two-timer. I'm back. You are. You are actually the first repeat guest on the show. We originally had you, I think it was on show number 30. 
I believe. And Supposedly the most amazing show you ever had. That's best just, ever, hands down. Yeah. So honestly, it Thanks, got sir. tremendous feedback. It was one of the most popular episodes. Oh, cool. For anybody that hasn't listened to episode number 30 with Mike Michalowicz, uh, you were on the show, you were talking to us about uh, a, a number of different topics, but kind of one of our focuses was on your book, Profit First, mm -hmm. uh, where you helped us to understand the importance of ensuring that our businesses were profitable, not just in general, but from day one, literally from day one. And I know that that book and that episode resonated with so many people in our audience. So when I found out that you had another book coming out, and I think the book is released today, um, it, it's, I'm, I'm pretty sure the book releases today. When I found out you had another book coming out, I was really excited about getting you back on the show to talk about that book and just helping us with, with uh, just your, your tremendous experience and expertise in, in helping us grow and scale and build our businesses. So thank you so much for being back. Oh, thanks. It's a, it's a joy being with you all and uh, discussing these topics. It's my passion. So thank you. It's awesome. great stuff. So your latest book is called Fix This Next. And can you give us a little overview of what the book is and, and what we can expect to learn from it? Yeah. So the thesis for this book um, and how I derive this is I, as I write my books, I'm actively involved with my readers. I actually host a uh, event. Uh, I'll send out an email out some awkward time, like two o'clock in the morning saying, first 50 people have signed up. It's totally free. Come to my office and I, I want to study your business, but also share my research. And uh, one of those events is coming up. And uh, uh, the most recent one, and, and talking with other people, I found that the, the biggest challenge entrepreneurs have is knowing what their biggest challenge is. So that's the thesis for the book was, was how do we know what really we need to work on? What's the one thing that our business most needs from us right now? So Fix This Next is a way to very simply identify the impactful issue your business needs served as opposed to the urgent and all the apparent issues. Because most entrepreneurs, you know, it's just like putting out fires. You come in with a plan for your day and that first email comes in, you're like, oh, day's over and you respond to emails. There's a queue of questions outside your door and our agenda is more dictated by others than it is on what would specifically serve the business. So this helps us pinpoint exactly what to work on. That's great. And uh, just for those that aren't familiar with Mike Michalowicz, you have five other books before this book. Again, I mentioned Profit First. Uh, there's also The Pumpkin Plan. There's Clockwork. I mean, you've got just some amazingly successful and um, books that have just literally changed the lives of so many entrepreneurs. I'm a huge fan of your books. The funny thing is when I talk to people either about your episode or I recommend your books in general, uh, one of the first questions I get is, okay, he's got a bunch of books. Which one should I start with? Yeah, and yeah. I never quite know which one to tell them to start with because each of your books basically stands alone. Now, I know in this book, you address that early on. You talk about the fact that you have the same issue. People ask you which book to start with and it's a kind of, uh, you have to ask questions of them. But it sounds like you think people should now start with this particular book. Why is this book, why is this book the kind of the, the seminal place to start uh, for any entrepreneur that's looking to, to, to take control of their business? Well, how came about? I used to blurt out whatever I was enthusiastic about. Um, my own books are in other books. I'm an avid reader of business books, and there's so many great books out there. So uh, today I'm reading Extreme Ownership. Last week I just finished Malcolm Gladwell's Talking to Strangers. And uh, so if someone asked me, what should I read last week? I'm like, Talking to Strangers, it's unbelievable. And then you asked me today, I'm like, Extreme Ownership, you need Extreme Ownership. Um, but what I've discovered is we don't necessarily need those books. What we need is the solution to our most impactful issue. You know, we need the most, I'm sorry, impactful solution to our biggest challenge we're facing now, the thing that'll move our business forward. So the better question, when someone says, what book should I read? The better question is, well, what's your biggest challenge? And pointing back to the thesis of this book, what I discovered is most people don't know their biggest challenge is. We identify the apparent issues. Oh, we don't have enough sales. Well, I gotta read more sales. And then it doesn't fix the business. And these businesses stay stuck, taking you know, two steps forward, yet three steps back. So the starting point is to have absolute clarity on what's the single most important issue at hand right now within your business that you need to focus your resources on. And that's why I wrote Fix This Next. So now the answer is pretty easy for me. When someone says, what book should I read? I'm like, well, do you really know what the biggest impactful issue in that hand right now is? And if you don't, I think Fix This Next could be a good tool for that. So that's why I'm encouraging people to start there with my, with my books. That's great. That's and excellent. 
Yeah, this book came at the perfect time, by the way, for me. I launched a new service business back at the beginning of this year. And through some alignment of the stars, we found that we hit uh, 200K in revenue by the end of the first month. And this far exceeded our expectations or our business plan, uh, which is obviously a good thing. Uh, But it also brought challenges as well. We were getting like more client calls than we could handle. uh, And we still didn't have a working website. And my operations manager was complaining that our trucks weren't wrapped and our our technicians didn't have their uniforms. Our marketing people needed stuff. We didn't have business cards for half of our team. Yeah, yeah basically pulling my hair out trying to figure out how do I do this? I can't do everything at once. And, and it's so funny. I, I got a copy of your book and I started reading and it really, it provided some tremendous clarity for me. So thank you for that from a personal level. You're, you're welcome. And it reminds me that there's a UPS commercial. I don't know if you remember this. This goes back like five or 10 years ago. It was hysterical. It's about a new business that's starting up and uh, they're selling some kind of widget and UPS is you know, pitching your services for logistics. And the commercial opens up and you see them they have the invention, they're all excited, and they click go on the website and activate the website. And in the background is one guy breathing like deeply into a brown bag that is hyperventilating, and they're like, please get sale, please get sale. And then the first sale comes through, goes bling, and they all like, oh my God, they start high-fiving. And then like a second later, it's like bling, bling, and there's like two, and they start going crazy. <laughs> and then there's like 50, and then there's like, Ugh, it starts pouring in, and the guy starts hyperventilating again. He's like, oh. And then UPS says, don't worry, we have you handled, right? So that's their commercial. But it's funny about the arc of entrepreneurship is what's a win today can become overwhelming tomorrow. And there is a structure our business has. I I call it the DNA of all business. Every business, actually like humanity, shares a common DNA. Yet we judge ourselves, and this is not a a negative thing. We just actually automatically judge ourselves by what we see on someone. So skin color, sex, height, weight, those are the things we can see instantly and we put a value on it. That's a form of prejudice. But our business, but in, internally, 99% of all humanity is identical. You know, we're the same. Well, business is, is very similar. 99% of business is the same, but we judge it on the skin and we say, look how different we are. Our businesses are so different. But understanding that the vast majority of business is actually identical, I was able to extract that DNA, if you will, build a structure, and now we can pinpoint what needs to be worked on in what sequence. And you know, you got great sales out of the gate. That's fantastic. But very quickly, that's going to indicate potentially an issue with profit, an, in, uh, an issue with efficiencies, and we need to resolve that. But once we resolve that, we may actually have to cycle back to amplifying those sales because of the new efficiencies we've brought about. So that's, that's the DNA of business, and we need to respond in order of where the bottleneck is within these hier- this hierarchy to, to keep the business going forward fluidly. Got it. That's really cool. So talk to us even more, Mike, about this whole, the DNA within the company and how so many at the core, so many businesses are similar, but they all have the, this DNA that you have to identify. And, and, and really in the book, you really do dig deep into uh, defining the equivalent of Maslow's hierarchy yeah. of needs to business. Like that is huge. It really, really resonated with me. So can you talk more about that, about how it applies in business? Absolutely. So there is a need structure for all of humanity. Um, Maslow articulated it through what subsequently became Maslow's hierarchy of needs and basically pointed out there's five levels of needs. I've taken that and translated into a business hierarchy of needs, but let's explore Maslow real quick. So Maslow explained that there's five needs starting with the most foundational need of all humanity, which he defined as physiological needs, meaning we all need to breathe air. Every human does. Every human needs water, food. Those are the base needs of survival. And if they are not being addressed, our bodies, we will naturally revert to getting that. If we are starving to death, we will seek out food. If we can't breathe, we will gasp for air. Once those needs are satisfied, then we elevate, according to Maslow, to the next hierarchy, next to the level, which is safety needs. Safety needs are shelter over us, uh, even financial protection, some kind of stability. We, We want to protect ourselves from harm. So, um, and then we can continue up. He then talks about the concept of belongingness, meaning to be community, to experience care and love. And then he talks about esteem and the highest level is called self-actualization, which is uh, living life's purpose. Well, this translates to business. Business has a hierarchy of needs too. But, but I want to explain one challenge of why the hierarchy of needs for humanity works very efficiently and effectively. And then where we stumble in the business hierarchy. We are all neurologically wired into ourselves. Our neural network internally is wired in so that our senses are collecting information, smell, touch, hearing, so forth. All, sight, all this stuff collects information and then gives us an instinctual feeling. 
if you if you ever walk down a dark alley and all of a sudden you start getting the the spooks like something's going to happen to you you should turn around and leave that dark alley very quickly there's a likelihood there'll be harm in front of you and the reason this is likely true is because our senses are triggering off all these different things, giving us direction and saying, oops, there's a safety level concern, exit, exit. And, and there's an alarm going off there and we should take action on that. Now, with the business hierarchy of needs, um, we are not neurologically wired into our business. Our business has a five levels of needs, just like Maslow's hierarchy. But since we're not neurologically wired into our business, this is where our gut instinct starts to fail us. You know, many times people say, oh, you know, well, we're struggling a little bit. My gut says we need more sales. Well, that's, that's just a guess. It doesn't, because we're not neurologically wired in, the inputs aren't there. So it's the collection of data and information that's the inputs that gives us clarity on that. And unfortunately, most entrepreneurs skip the data and the analysis. So the business hierarchy of needs I structured, so the analysis is very simple, but it's factual based as opposed to just gut alone. And uh, here's, the, here's the five levels of the business hierarchy of needs. The foundational level in the DNA of all business is we need sales. So what Jay experienced, every business, if you have zero sales, you have nothing because sales is the creation of cash. It is the lifeblood of the business. No cash, no business. So sales is the fundamental level. And sales is an is a open term. It includes marketing, the generation of prospects, the conversion of them to clients, but it must result in inbound cash flow. So sales is the creation of cash. The next level up in this hierarchy is profit. And profit is the creation of stability in an organization. If there is no profitability, the business is extremely unstable. A business can have millions and millions of dollars of sales and no profit, and it will tumble. It will destroy the business because it's not able to retain cash. So the next level up, which is equivalent to Maslow's safety level, is profit. Profit is the shelter for an organization, where sales is the equivalent for physiological needs. Sales is the oxygen for a business. And interestingly, so many of the businesses I studied for this book and subsequently have met with now um, are stuck at these first two levels because we're not instinctually wired into our business. Many business owners um, are, are running their business. They're not having, they don't have any profit. They can't pay their own salary. Uh, there's no earnings being retained. There's this overwhelming stress. And the business owner says instinctually, ah, oh, we need more sales out of this. It's absurd when you look at it from Maslow's hierarchy. That's someone saying, we have no shelter. There's this blizzard coming through. We have no clothing. We're freezing to death. And instead of seeking shelter, we're going to breathe more air in because we're reverting to a base level need. So they pursue more sales and the sales does not protect the business. It actually puts more stress on it because we're still exposed to the elements. So sales and then profit. Uh, the next level up in the business hierarchy of needs is order. Order is uh, equivalent to the belongingness stage in Maslow, but order is efficiency in organization. It's where there's no dependency on an individual. It's dependency on the community. The community is the employees, the clients, the vendors. There's, there's an equal responsibility spread out. In fact, the ultimate test is actually extracting the owner themselves from the operations of the business, and the business should be able to sustain and grow in their absence. The owner is just a cog, not the controller. Then the next level up is impact. Impact is the creation of transformation. This is where a business realizes it is not about the transaction, it's about the transformation it's having on its clientele. So you, you know, your product, how's it changing people's lives? Um, did, does it invoke a sense of a community for them? Do, do, they, do they go out there and say, this, this company is, is saving lives or serving me in such an amazing way, uh, it's made my day, my week, my life. Harley Davidson is a, is a classic case study in this. You, know, you can buy a motorcycle anywhere, but when you buy a Harley Davidson, you're part of the Harley Davidson community. You may even throw a tattoo on yourself. You're, you're now a weekend warrior. So the impact level is the creation of transformation. We're no longer a transaction. The highest level is legacy. This is the creation of permanence. This is where we design and create a business to live on into perpetuity in absence of the owner. This is the day that we realize the business was never about ownership in the first place. It was about stewardship that we were simply a component in bringing life to this business, but it's not our business. The business is of greater service to the community. And we start extracting ourselves out from even a ownership of the business and see it as a stewardship. That way the business can live into perpetuity in absence of the owner. Uh, and it can continue to do great deeds and great service in absence of that control of the owner. Wow. That's really powerful. And I think so many of us, especially so much, uh, so many people in our audience who are small business owners, 
because of what you mentioned earlier, we get into the office, you've got all these grand plans for the day, right. and then that inbox happens and the fire happens. We often don't really, we don't really even have an opportunity, we don't feel like, to make it through those first two basic needs and to even get further beyond that throughout the day. So to keep all of those needs at a hierarchical level uh, in front of us is very inspiring. And it also, it also just helps us realize that if we, if we do take steps to do what these most important things are, then we can achieve the whole, the more holistic picture so that we are, we are achieving stewardship, permanence, all of those things that are really kind of why we get into these businesses in the first place. So can you, can you help us uh, in actionably, like you're, you talk about in the book, this main theme of yeah. focusing on those most important tasks, right? And just not trying to do everything at once, all of those things. So help people like Jay, help other people who are small business owners figure out what it is that is that single most important task. Yeah. So um, all I'm sure is this thing called the survival trap. And um, this is where we, where we are in the moment and why it's not working. And then the, the pathway to move forward to your point is, is through this process. So the survival trap is if you have a piece of paper in front of you, you can draw the letter A and put a circle around it. That's where you are in this moment, right in the center of the paper. The interesting thing is most businesses, since it's in fire extinguishing mode, says, okay, I have a problem. That's where point A is. Any action I take that moves me away from point A, so you can go in any direction, hire a Rainmaker salesperson, you know, because I have a sales issue, run a discount, uh, you know, cut prices in half, double prices so we can make more margin. Any action we take that takes us out of point A gives us this immediate sense of relief. Hey, I'm resolving that issue. But then since there's no clear direction on the impactful issue at hand in the business, it just moves us to a new point A. And so most businesses are in this arbitrary pattern, like a web-like structure of going in this crazy circle. Well, what we do with this business hierarchy of need is we put a beacon out there and say, the most important issue the business has right now is, say it's an efficiency issue. We need to remove bottlenecks in our process because we're running slowly. And go through this analysis, you'll identify what it is, but say it's that issue. Now you put a very clear point B on the map. Now when you're looking at point A, whatever the problems are today, we simply give ourselves pause and say, this issue I'm tackling, is this moving me toward re releasing the bottleneck we have? If so, it's a prioritized task. If it's something else, it's not the priority. So we can start now channeling ourselves in a consistent direction and moving forward. Most businesses don't have that beacon to move to. Most business owners are in a action, something happens, a reaction mode. Action, reaction, action, reaction. What we need is action, consideration, reaction. So the business hierarchy of needs sits right here in the middle. There's an action that happens. We then consider where is it sitting on this hierarchy and is it addressing our vital need, the most important impactful issue. If not, it's something that can go back into the can and wait a little bit later. If so, we move forward with it. It gives a little bit of a pregnant and important pause between action and reaction. Yeah. One of the things I love about this book is, is basically what you just said. There's another book and actually I'm looking behind you. Anybody that's watching us on video can see behind you on your bookshelf. Yeah. There's, there's a book called The Goal by a guy named oh, uh, so Ilyahu Goldratt. So and, and it's funny because as soon as I started reading um, Fix This Next, uh, that's the book that came to mind. And then in, I think it was chapter two, you actually mentioned that yep. book again, The okay. Goal. And it's, this is one of my favorite books of all time. It's a book that I recommend to everybody. One of the problems I have with this book is it's somewhat academic. It's, it's more of yeah. kind of a, it, it, it's, it's business schoolish. It's, it's, it's more, uh, it, it's less relatable to the masses. Yeah. And so when I started reading fix this next, the first thing I thought was this is kind of the goal, but rewritten for us, for the typical entrepreneur, not the business school entrepreneur, not the big company entrepreneur, not the guy that's running in, in that book, a factory with, with, with 700 employees. This is kind of for the small business owner. And so I love the fact that you took a topic that has been so near and dear to my heart for forever and you made it relatable to everybody. Yeah. I, I too love the goal. You know, it's based on the theory of constraints. It is an academic read because it's theoretically based. Yeah. Uh, it's told in a parable though. So it's very digestible. That, that's what I like about the book. Um, what I do is um, I, I struggle to consume academic knowledge. And I'm not actually, the goal was unique that I could actually understand that one, but there's some books that are so heavy in theory, the content is so relevant and important, but my, I, I can't consume it. So how my mind works is how do I make this easier? How, I have to keep whittling it down until all of a sudden it clicks. So that's my uh, 
challenge, but also my ability, because I need to simplify it to make it super digestible, I take this knowledge from other extraordinary authors, Eli Goldratt being one of the best of all time for the business space, in my opinion, taking that kind of knowledge and other people's knowledge and then condensing it down to very actionable. I have, I'm not in my office, my other office, I have right above my desk is the business hierarchy of needs. You know, these tools I develop are not alone just to edify readers. It's because I struggle with these things. I need them for my businesses. So I make the tool, develop it, uh, and writing a book for me is a, a labor of love. It takes me about five years. It, I'm not an efficient writer. It doesn't, you know, I don't just write magically. And I go through a lot of testing. So that process, the business hierarchy of needs have been around for about five years, now about six. Uh, where I test out my own business, I can, I'm blessed to have a couple companies I can guinea pig it on. And I bring in these readers in these you know, crazy events I do to, to go through the process. And I use them as case studies to make sure they work out. And, and the goal, my consistent goal is make it simple. Now, don't make it, don't make it, I think it was uh, Einstein said, don't make it simpler, but make it simple. You know, I, I want to remain, the, the effectiveness must remain, but the process must be simplified. That's what I try to achieve. Yeah. Make it as simple as possible, but no simpler. Yeah, that was it. Excellent. And so, Mike, I would really love um, to bring a real life example to the table that um, I would love to apply this whole strategy to with the, the point A in the middle in the, B, yeah. the, the beacon and getting into that specific space and realizing that all the other activities should maybe be on the back burner until that yeah. happens to yeah. make sure that I'm grasping this properly because I think it will help our audience relate it to their businesses as well. So I own, um, I recently started uh, with uh, with an associate, a real estate staging company where we put, oh, cool. uh, you know, all the furniture into the houses to get them ready yeah, yeah, for yeah, sale. I totally right? know. That's, that's a great very, business. It it's very amplifies, fun. It amplifies the value of homes. There's no question about it. It absolutely does. It's yeah. really fun. And we were very fortunate to learn that there's not a whole lot of competition where we are uh, here in Sarasota, Florida. Great problem to have, right? Yeah. So right off the bat, we have our website almost done. We've, yep. got, uh, we've got a strategy for our furniture. furniture. We have all kinds of, uh, of people ready to target and so on and so forth. Yep. We start making phone calls right off the bat. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Excellent. My business partner and I are like, oh, minor detail. We have no furniture yet. We haven't made it that far, right? right. So what we, our, our thought process was, and again, this is really good timing. So I want to see if this is the right thought process with your book. Um, the, the thought process is the biggest need right now is to make sure that we have the inventory so that we can successfully execute all of these sales. But what needs to be sacrificed is making more sales calls right now, right? Because I think in a new business, what yeah. the typical thing to do be just get as much business as you can, just keep going, keep going with that sales funnel. However, yeah. we suspect we need to move to that beacon of being able to truly serve those customers in back burner, making more calls right now. Does that sound about right with the strategy that you're describing? It sounds right. And I, I want to give a couple insights or tweaks. So right. what you're experiencing is called the double helix trap. And the double helix trap is where there's an amplification in sales in a small business, but the sales hit a certain peak that the people who are selling actually have to convert over to doing. So then we, we revert our attention to the deliverables and then the sales drop because we're not, we're not selling. So now there's a drop. Then uh, when we're delivering the services and that's starting to wane out because we're delivered on our promises, now we got to start selling again. So we revert our attention there and it starts going up and it causes this wave pattern of, of doing versus sales. That it causes a double helix. So it's a very common trap. Um, your instinctual response is right. So you don't have inventory. Uh, you need to provide. In the sales level of the business hierarchy of needs, there's this thing called delivering on commitments. A sale is not complete when many... Uh, traditional salespeople think it is. The handshake, you know, oh, we got a deal, made a sale, didn't make a sale. The sale's only complete when the agreement is fulfilled, which means the customer fills their obligation, which is usually a payment, and the vendor, we provide our obligation, which is the delivery of the service experience. Only when that's complete is the money actually legally uh, transferred and, and the, the project's done and the sale is done. So this sounds like a delivery of commitments, meaning the prospect is saying, yep, I'll do it, let's do it, you need to now deliver in order to, for them to pay. The opportunity here may be not buying inventory though. So the, the instinctual response is we need to procure inventory, but the, the BHN says it's simply, are you able to deliver on commitments, which opens us up to say, 
maybe we don't need to buy inventory. Maybe there's rental. Maybe there's a swap we can do or a consignment. You know, maybe uh, what we can do is when someone's moving out of a house and they need a storage facility for two months, we can rent that furniture and actually have it stored at a house that's being displayed. And so it, it changed our perspective. The, the fact is, I don't know if you need inventory, you need stuff in those houses to make an exceptional display um, so that the house, house's value goes up. And so just buying inventory may not be the only solution. You're definitely on it. We're at a sales level right now. It's very common for a startup business. And uh, we just want to start playing within, within that category of, of delivery beyond just buying inventory. It would be my only major That category. makes it so absolutely relatable and really brings this whole situation to life with the things you're describing in the book. So thank you for really clarifying that. Because I do think, like you said, this is something many new entrepreneurs, many new small business owners fall into this double helix type of situation. So by exploring other options and, and figuring out that process and repeating it, then they can be successful. So thank you for clarifying. No, you know, you're very welcome. It's a great topic. You know, one thing that's interesting too, in the book, I talk about a guy named Jacob Limmer. He, he owns a coffee shop, well, actually multiple locations in South Dakota, been in business for 13 years. And uh, it was interesting, his response as we went through this experience, he, he saw the business hierarchy needs of an, as an aspirational hierarchy that you want to climb to the top. And the reality is the business will cycle through all levels at all times for the entirety of the business. We don't just climb to the top. We'll experience that, but we will have to cycle back down because if we want to have higher degrees of legacy and higher degrees of impact, we actually need to amplify our sales at the base. The foundation always needs to be strong enough to support the level above it. Well, he's going through this and uh, he went through the analysis of the business hierarchy and it kept on pinpointing he had a sales issue. Actually, the most fundamental sales issue of all which is called lifestyle congruence. Lifestyle congruence is, is the business designed to support the lifestyle you've anticipated and what's the lifestyle requirements you have and how is it linked? Many business owners that say we need to sell more, but don't really consider the impact on themselves personally. And he said, I didn't want to answer that question. He's like, I've been in business for 13 years. I'm beyond this. And uh, he kept on going through the analysis and kept on pinpointing we have a lifestyle congruence issue. After his third or fourth iteration, he says, I give in. He goes, I got to go back to the foundation. When building, and, and he did, and now his business is healthier than ever before. The, the lesson is this, building our business on the business hierarchy of needs is like building any kind of structure. It's a five level structure in this case. And if we start focusing on building a massive third floor, but we don't have a second or first or basement, the third floor is in thin air, it just collapses below it. So we need to have a strong foundation. And if the foundation is cracked, you don't keep building up. You've got a foundation, we have to restabilize it. And, and conversely, and this is a weird phenomenon I've seen too, some businesses only save the foundation, sell more, sell more, sell more. And they're focused on this massive basement and they put a tool shed of profitability above it and it falls into the basement and gets crushed. So it is all related and it has to be structurally sound throughout. You will cycle down even if you're in business for 13 years, 13 centuries, we will cycle through this. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. I think a lot of us tend to think of businesses being very linear. Um, we do one right. thing, then we do the next and we grow and we grow and we grow. And in, in your in your words, it's, it's very iterative. And, yes. and just to use the example you gave, yeah, you don't build the second level until after you build the first level, but you don't paint the first level until you've got the entire structure built. You're going to work all the way up to the fifth level before you go and start painting and putting in flooring and cabinets. It's an yeah, iterative you're sure process. You're going to move in Carol's furniture, you know, exactly. like trying to build above it. Exactly. So it is a very iterative process. In the book, you talk about this idea of the omen. And it's, yeah. it's kind of once you pinpoint where you are, how you take action to kind of get to the resolution. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because it's such an important theme throughout the book. Yeah, there, there is. And there's a lot of other books out there that are phenomenal on uh, setting measurements. I think there's one called Measure What Matters uh, that talks about what's called OKRs, um, which was great for large companies. What I needed to do is distill that knowledge and other stuff into what really works for setting goals for small business. There's another method called SMART. Um, which is it's good for personal goals, but really didn't translate. The omen is uh, what we're testing is the most effective way to uh, facilitate a result that we want. So once you pinpoint your need in the business hierarchy, the, the, the question is, how do you resolve it? And we do it through omen. It's, it's an acronym. It stands for th uh, the four stages. First is set a clear objective. So, you know, Carol's a good example. She uh, has sales, I mean, there's demand. Um, we now need to deliver. So we have a delivery issue. The, the first objective we set is we must deliver for the 10 homes that we are expected to supply furniture for, right? So we set an objective. 
Then the M stands for measurements. How do you know you're delivering or meeting or making progress toward that objective? So it could be the procurement of inventory. It could be the consignment of inventory. It could be a swap plan of some sort with people that are in, in transition. Uh, there's many ways to structure it, but we need to set the measurements of how do we know that we're moving toward the objective of supplying furniture for these 10 houses, right? How do we know we're making progress? That's the measurement stage. Uh, and, and you want to keep the measurements as simple as possible, two or three measurements. You know, do we have couches in our warehouse? That's one option. Or do we have commitments from uh, other people to, to provide these couches on a consignment basis or whatever the measurements are. What are the most impactful measurements that, that prove we're moving toward or not the objective? Next is E. E is the evaluation frequency. And what we need to do is set up on a periodic basis to measure our progress. It's the milestones. And do we want to check every day? Are we making progress toward this? You know, in Carol's case, that may be too frequently. You know, to say, do we get a couch? Do we get a couch? Do we get a couch every day? It may be every three or four weeks we want to see our progress there. There may be this massive demand right now. We got to check this on an hourly basis. You know, we got to move, move, move. So you set the evaluation frequency to make sure you're making progress. You don't set it so frequently that it becomes a nuisance where there's no measurable progress. Theoretically, you could check every 10 seconds if you have a couch. And that would be an <laughs> overwhelm and distracting. You could check once a month and always clients may go away. So we have to figure out the frequency. And N stands for nurture. Nurture is a, a very critical component of goal setting that is in my research, often ignored. Nurture simply means to allow yourself the flexibility to adjust the objectives, to adjust the measurements, and come up with new strategies when it's failing to, uh, we're failing to make progress in the way we anticipated. Many people will set a goal from a business, I want to do a million dollars this year, and uh, when they're not achieving it, they're like, well, I guess I'm not going to hit my goal, uh, and it, it then becomes acceptable not to hit the goal. Uh, other people say, you know, you've got to hit that goal at all costs, and they, they start doing things that are actually contrary to serving the business. They start selling you know, stuff that's outside the scope of what they do just to hit the goal. Well, neither of those are a, a good approach. Nurturing is allowing ourselves uh, an objective view of our progress and then giving ourselves a flexibility to make adjustments. Usually do this by in, in, uh, involving other team members, you know, not just ourselves because we're, we can be full of our bias. Do we have other people in our organization um, a partner, other people that can give outside perspectives. Do we bring in an outside coach or something to help us nurture along the process? So the OMEN method I found to be the most efficient way toward achieving the goals we set for our organizations and resolving these vital needs we have in our business. I love that. And, and so kind of to summarize um, the book, not that you can summarize a book in four points, but to summarize the book, kind of the whole idea behind solving your roadblock, getting past the next roadblock is first discovering what that roadblock is, right. um, pinpointing the specific issue, fixing the issue, and then repeating. And that's the four-step process that you talk about in the book. Discover, that's pinpoint, exactly fix, repeat. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's truly that simple. And uh, sadly, most entrepreneurs miss even the first step. We, we don't even go into the finding. We just go into whatever is presenting itself we tackle. So it's step one, we already are off the tracks. And so this is just a simple way to get back on the tracks and move through the impactful thing. I love this. And, and here's the thing that, that I really like about this book is it's your sixth book. Um, but in, in a lot of ways, it should have been your first. Because, first, exactly. Be, because uh, let's talk about the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You talk about sales first. You had a book or you have a book called The Pumpkin Plan. Yep. That talks all about sales. So it's kind of like if you want to drill down on that, hierarchy of need for your business, there's an entire book that you've written about that. And then you have Profit Second. You have a book called Profit First, um, yep. which drills down on that in gory detail. You have a book called Clockwork, which kind of deals with that third thing in the hierarchy of needs order. Um, so it, it's kind of funny that you, you've written these books in the past um, and it's kind of like in your brain, you knew here are the key components, but it took you to your sixth book to kind of lay out, here's the, uh, here's the table of contents to your right. business. Right. Isn't that funny? So, you know, the books I've been writing up to this point has always been, what does my reader need next? What's the next yep. challenge that they're facing? So we were always have all been going through the hierarchy of needs. It's always existed. It's not like it's really been invented. I just simply enunciated what already existed. So we're already going through this and I was trying to address it. And then this has become what we call the hub book. My publisher, same to you, said, why didn't you write this book first? And I said, well, because I didn't know I needed to write this. And it's become the hub book. And now I'm already working on two future books. They plug, they all are plugging into the hierarchy and you'll see every book I write 
by default has to fit into this hierarchy. Awesome. Perfect. Can you give us any examples of people that have kind of used, I, I know you have tons of case studies in the book just to, to, to kind of, uh, and, and we thank you for your help with Carol and uh, we'll be expecting your, uh, your invoice in the mail for helping her. <laughs> um, but can you talk Are about you any, really? <laughs> can you talk about any other case studies uh, either from the book or from real life um, uh, of businesses that have kind of gone through this process, this, this, um, this, this fix yeah, it, fix this me. next process. Yeah, so there's quite a few. There's uh, in the book I talk about a guy named Tersh Bissett. He's uh, owns a company called Icebound in Savannah. Uh, they're a HVAC company. Uh, fascinating case study with him because he was working on impact. They they wanted to be social contributors to their community. They wanted to be of service, so they were actively uh, contributing to the community. So performing or focusing on a very high level, but they had a need back at the sales level. Classic example, uh, not for profits do this all the time, by the way, where we have to be contributors to our society. We got to do great things. And they don't focus on the donations, the things that keep, which is sales, which keeps them afloat. So they want to do great things, but they've crippled themselves by not being able to give themselves the stuff that empowers that. Well, that's actually what Tersh and his team were experiencing. They're focused on giving to the community, but they weren't focusing on sales. He went through the BHN, Business Hierarchy of Needs, pinpointed we have an avatar issue, meaning we don't know who our ideal client is. They clarified that and then they made the you know, courageous decision of catering to the avatar and uh, deferring out when opportunities would come in that were non-avatar clientele. And the business started to grow. Sales on, on a volume basis went up, but also profitability started to really enhance itself. So they, they went back to the foundation, shorted it up, they got profit uh, in place. Now he's focusing on efficiency, order, delivery, with the aspiration to get back to the impact level to go back and serve the community. There's, which we didn't talk about yet, but the, the five levels are broken into two stages. Stage one is what I call the get stage and stage two is the give stage. The get stage is sales, profit, and order. We, our business needs to get more sales, get more profit, get more efficiency within the organization. That's the get stage. And only once we get that, can we give impact and legacy? Can we be contributors? You know, there's that famous saying, you got to give to get. And the business hierarchy of needs actually showed that's wrong. It's you have to get to give. You can't give un until you've, uh, you get. So um, he's a great example. Um, there's another case, uh, Cindy Thomason, bookkeeper, um, all about uh, organizational efficiency. And it was the question that we pinpointed really was, how do we get employees to act like owners? And um, I'm actually maybe dedicating a book to this. I'm doing extensive research on this solution but effectively, it's alignment of intentions. Here it is in, in short, what we're doing with Cindy's organization is most businesses say, here's the corporate goal. And the employer's are like, okay, whatever. Uh, there's no visceral commitment to it because the organizational goal is really the goal of the owner. So there's a visceral commitment from the owner. This is what I want. I want a $10 million business. I want the new house, the new car. And the employer's are like, I want a job. When we understand individual intentions of employees, I want to buy a house for myself one day. I, I want to learn Spanish or what, you know, all these different things. And that was actually in our own business. When we ran this analysis, we found out that three of our employees want to learn Spanish. We had no idea. Someone wants to buy a house. Another person uh, wants actually to, to spend more time with their elderly parents. Once you understand everyone's intentions, then what we do is we align the path to the corporate goal, the owner's goal with serving the intentions of all the employees. So now everyone's goal is being satisfied and ownership amplifies because it's all about us as individuals. So that was identified in Cindy's business uh, in the hierarchy of needs at the order level. So those are a couple more examples. Mike, this has all been so great. I love all these processes that you right. were lying out for our listeners um, so they can really apply it in real life to their business. It gives everybody some really actionable uh, items and tips to think about as they approach the right way to move forward. So thank you. Now, typically, as you know, we wrap up this episode with our four more, which is yeah. four questions, but you did that like way back when, when right, we had you right, on as on an amazing 30. guest the first time. <laughs> there you go. So let's just skip right to the more. Mike, will you please let our listeners know where they can find out more about you, where they can get your book and how they can connect. Yeah, I'll, I'll give one site to go to that I think will help specifically with the fix this next process. It's fixthisnext.com. And the reason I think it'll be so helpful is on that site, we've developed an online evaluation where you can actually analyze your business five minutes or less and pinpoint where you are. You don't even need the book. Now, the, the book is great education around how to leverage a system. There's a lot of knowledge there, but if you want the instant five minute result, where's my vital need 
today, right now, you can go to fixthisnext.com. It's a free evaluation and uh, you can do it repeatedly too. Every time you resolve an, uh, an issue, you can go back to fixthisnext.com, reevaluate your business, identify your next vital need and move forward again. Also, we'll make sure that is in our show notes. Okay. And Mike, uh, let's quick, one more quick plug for the book. So Fix This Next is now available, I assume, anywhere that books are sold um, and is a great uh, accompaniment to your awesome other books, The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, The Pumpkin Plan, uh, Clockwork, Profit First. Am I missing any? There's one more, Surge. Surge, yeah, yeah. So uh, thank you. Yeah, Fix This Next is available everywhere. Amazon, usually, if you like them or hate them, they usually have the best price. Um, So check it out. It it came out, if you're watching this on April 28th, uh, that's the, today is the day it's coming out. But if, uh, if you're watching after it's, it's out, it's available. Uh, it is, I think it's the most important work I've ever done. I hope it's of great service to people, but you can pick it up at Amazon Barnes and Nobles too, or your local bookstore, but I encourage Amazon. Awesome. Thank you so much. And you mentioned you're you. working on two others. So that gives me an opening to invite you back at least two more times. I'm in, I'm in <laughs> 2021. I'm going to be working aggressively on those to come out. Wonderful. Uh, awesome. Congratulations on the release. And we look forward to talk to you soon. Thanks, Thanks Jay. Mike. Thanks, Carol. Okay, so I know we recorded that interview about six weeks ago, but the crazy thing is that is more relevant, at least in our businesses, and I imagine in many of our listeners' businesses, that interview is probably more relevant today than it was even at the time we recorded it. I know we're all facing new challenges. We're all facing new issues. Uh, A lot of businesses these days are figuring out how to reinvent themselves, rebrand themselves to kind of uh, just survive in this whole new world. So... I highly recommend anybody out there, go pick up this book. Um, I I hope you enjoyed this interview because I got so much out of it and I'm so glad we did it. Um, And and I I don't know. What did you think, Carol? That's amazing. And Mike is just so solid. He has so much great knowledge and he's just so real and he's experienced it all. So of course, love everything about him, love his books. And I really hope you listeners go get his book. And I hope that you can implement some of his great ideas into your business. Absolutely. Everybody, please stay safe, stay healthy. Hope uh, hope you're staying sane as well. Uh, have a wonderful week. Thank you again for an amazing first year. And we look forward to seeing you and talking to you again next week you know what time to wrap it up baby it is time Ah, to believe it's been a whole year i know crazy so cool (laughs) everybody i'm carol she's jay wait a second go what 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 did you say what did you just say i don't think i am carol i think you're carol (laughs) i'm gonna actually have to start right this is this really shouldn't be the hardest part of the show let me try come on let me try let me try that again she's carol you're carol i'm pointing to you Uh you're carol Uh and i i believe am jay Nice work. Now go fix the biggest issue in your business today. Ha, we did it. Everybody have a great day. Stay strong, stay tough, and just survive. Get through, thrive, and survive, and have a great day. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye. 